I want to talk here a little bit about why I think this story is so infinitely readable. Um, or to be clear, what I want to talk about is the literary nature of this story. Um, the, the famous literary critic Eric Auerbach um, in his famous book Mimesis uh, held up this story as like the paradigm of biblical narrative in contrast in his view to sort of Greek storytelling, right, Homer. Uh, Greek storytelling, Homeric epics, as you know, uh, are like full of detail, sometimes excruciating detail, right? Um, shields, ships, etc. right? In Homer, I know how people are dressed. I know their appearance. I know what they say. I know their inner thoughts. Um, but Homer wants us to understand absolutely everything that's happening. That's not quite the case in the story of the binding of Isaac. We get nothing but the barest bones here. God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And Abraham just kind of like starts in on it. He hears what God has to say. And then like the next morning he started packing up. What was Abraham thinking when he got the command, when he started packing? What did Abraham say to Isaac about it? Unknown. Uh, even bigger question, right? I think, what was Isaac thinking? Also unknown. The gaps in the story, right? Again, not in the action of the story, but in like, not the play-by-play -play of what's happening, but in, in the color commentary, right? The gaps are just immense. Um, there's no story here. Sorry, there's plenty of story. There's no emotion here. The narrator gives us no emotion. The characters give us no emotion. There's no explicit fear. God recognizes it, but we don't. There's no fear. There's no wonder. There's no relief expressed, right? None of the emotions you'd expect in this kind of story. And yet it's an undeniably emotional story. And for me, at least, the high point emotionally is, is here in, in verses seven through eight. Um, I'll read them real quick, just because it'll help. Um, right. uh, they, they're on their, they're, they've gone uh, three days on their journey, uh, and the, the mountain is in sight. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he answered, yes, my son. And he said, here are the fire stone and the wood, but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will see to the sheep for his burnt offering, my son. And the two of them walked on together. Even as I, as I read it, right, like, there's, there's just, there's no emotion expressed on the surface of the text. But I find it to be an incredibly emotional little passage. Isaac's question, right, where's the sheep for the burnt offering? You know, the, there's so many different ways to read that. Um, for me, Abraham's use of my son when he responds to Isaac here is like heart-wrenching. It may not be apparent, if you're not totally familiar with the text, but this, what we have right here, these verses are the only dialogue between Abraham and Isaac in the entire Bible. And Abraham with the, my son is just like, it's almost too much for me. Um, but I, I wanna think like how much, as we read this, how much do we as readers need to add to make this feel real as opposed to just like, again, the barest bones of story. Um, we may, for example, imagine when Isaac asks the question, right? Where's the sheep for the, where's the sheep for the burnt offering? We may imagine him as like slowly realizing that something is amiss. Like he's looking around and he's like, ah, something's missing here, right? We, we may imagine that, but that's not in the text, right? That's us as readers filling in the empty emotional spaces. And honestly, we could do that depending on how we're feeling on any given day in all sorts of different ways. 
and I will say that for me, the most poignant line in the entire story is the two of them walked on together, right? How much weight is there in just that silent walking together? Um, this story, it stretches time. It, play, it plays with, with time. God makes the demand and the next thing we know, Abraham is preparing and going. And the three day journey, Abraham and Isaac and the servants, this three day journey passes in between verses, right? They packed up for their journey. And then on the third day, right? That, that whatever's happening in there, it just, it goes by again, without even uh, actually taking place narratively. But then the story suddenly stops, right? And takes the time for Abraham to leave the servants behind and instruct them to wait. And for Abraham to load the wood onto Isaac. It's like, as the story rushes toward the inevitable, it's like this, this small hitch in the, in, the, uh, in the time. All we know of the final climb, right? They've, the three days journey, and then they're finally climbing up the mountain. All we know about it is this, this conversation, uh, Isaac's question and Abraham's answer. So again, that also passes by, described only with this, to my mind again, incredibly poignant moment. And once they arrive at the top of the mountain, time both hastens and slows down simultaneously. So um, they arrived at the place of which God had told him. After all of the preparation and the travel and the conversation between verse two with the instruction and here, right, sudden, suddenly we're here, we've arrived. And, and then it's like Abraham is, is going suddenly so fast. Abraham built an altar there. He laid out the wood. He bound his son Isaac. He laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Like after, it's just, it's like one thing after another, action after action. It's like he's rushing. Um, considering how, you know, all we've done so far is walk and talk. And now suddenly it's bang, 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 bang with, with all of this stuff. And Abraham just going so fast. But at the same time, that we want to sort of slow to stop, man. Like at the same time, the detail of the process slows everything down. It's almost like slow motion. We can see each step one by one, Like they travel in one big leap. But here it's like, no, he built an altar and laid out the wood and bound his son and put him on the altar, right? Even as the actions come hastening, hastening one on top of each other uh, by giving us all of them, it like stretches the time out and then marvelously to me, the, the final bit, which is its own verse, then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, right? That, that one gesture of reaching for the knife takes almost as long as all of the preparation that came before it, all of the binding and all of the building. It's as if the narrator is like making sure there's like time for God to intervene, right? Like, I'm gonna have him do this real slow. You're gonna you're gonna intervene, right? Like it's it's you're gonna stop this. I, I just think it's it's like it's marvelous. Uh, this this really sparse, bare bones, no interiority kind of storytelling may feel simplistic, but I think as any reader of I don't know, let's say Hemingway, uh, as any reader of Hemingway knows, right? It's really anything but simplistic. Uh, now, I don't think that the author of this text ever thought that we would, that we, 3,000 years later, or whatever, would be so engrossed in interpreting it and filling in the gaps and trying to understand the psychology of the characters. I'm pretty sure that whoever wrote this would be confused by the entire idea of psychology. But the text absolutely leaves space for all of that. And I would imagine that all readers ancient and modern alike, feel those needs, right? the need to fill those gaps, even with just sort of tone of voice. Um, and actually, I don't have to guess that. We know from extensive ancient interpretations that that's true, right? That those gaps are being filled constantly. And in, in that regard, this is actually a magnificently crafted text that gives us space for all of that. 